Hello. It is great to see you. you guys were singing fantastic. It was really great hearing you and just hearing the um, help the neighbors heard as well. It was just such encouragement hearing you all sing really well. Thank you for that. I was The other day I was driving my car, and you know, if you've got um, AirPlay or you've got Amazon Music or whatever you have, sometimes the algorithms just give you a song. And uh, I heard this song, and the song was written by a guy named Jason Bradley DeFore. And some of you, although I don't know that many of you, might know him as Jelly Roll. <clears throat> and how many of you actually know who Jelly Roll is? Yeah, there's four or five of us, right? And Jelly Roll, if you've seen him before, he kind of looks like a Jelly Roll. And anyways, Jason wrote a song, and his song is about, I need a favor. This is what he said. I'm going to quote some of the words from the lyrics of the song. Because as I heard this song, I was going, that works great for this passage we're looking at this morning. I need a favor. He says, I only talk to God when I need a favor. And I only pray when I can't get a prayer. So who am I? Who am I to expect a savior? But I only talk to God when I need a favor. But God, I need a favor. I know amazing grace and I know I ain't been living those words. I swear I spend most Sundays drunk. More Sundays drunk than I do in church. I have a hardcover King James that's been saving dust on my nightstand. And I don't know what to say about the time that I have on my hand. I only talk to God when I need a favor. I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. So, who am I? Who am I to expect a Savior? Oh, if I only talk to God when I need a favor, but God, I need a favor. And in the passage this morning, we're going to look at some people who are talking to God. Boy, they needed a favor. If, if there was anybody who needed a favor, these, this group of men needed a favor, and they needed a big favor. If you have your Bibles, you're going to want to open up to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, we're going to spend the whole entire morning in one particular section of Scripture. Luke 17... And we're going to look at it from verses 17 through 19. And there is a whole lot in this passage, and there's a little twist at the end, even though it's hard for us to see it in our English translation. Luke is writing, and he writes this story. He says, now, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going to a village, ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood a distance. And they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? There are other, where were the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Oh, oh, as I was just unpacking this sermon, as I practiced it this morning, this is a great passage. And, and there's so much stuff into it. In fact, I'm going to come back to this briefly because I think there's even something else in it that we're not going to touch on today. Lepers. There were 10 lepers around. And lepers, you need to know they were ravaged by this disease. They were literally stinky, dirty, maybe even deformed. Maybe they, had, they were missing some toes. Maybe they were missing a couple of fingers. Maybe they had some open sores. We don't know. They, they, were, they were probably deformed in some aspect. As a result, the lepers, they were unemployed. They were homeless. They were criticized. And they were judged by everyone else. Remember in the passage earlier, who sinned? This man or his parents? Can you imagine the judgment you would have on that person who had leprosy, who was living on the outcast, now homeless, now demoralized, now, now a recluse, living in the fields while you walked along the path? And you're thinking, oh, what sin did they do in order to live in that situation, in that squalor, in that messed up moment of life? So they were ravaged by this disease. It infected everything about them. And then they were rejected by everyone. 
they were rejected by everyone. They were scary. You wouldn't want to spend time because you would be afraid that you would catch that disease. You wouldn't want to spend time with them. And, and you were forbidden, actually, to hang out with them. They were the down and outs. They were the down and dirties. Maybe at one time they were a leader. Maybe they were a good business person. Maybe they were a great husband. Maybe they were a, a, a great farmer. Then they started to see white things on their, their arms, and they just knew. They saw some stores, and they just knew. They went and got checked out by the priest. And then they lost everything. No matter what they did, no matter how successful they were, no matter who they were, they lost everything when the disease captured them. It was, it, it, disease didn't matter whether you're rich or poor, young or old, you got it. You became rejected by everyone. Your wife, your family, your kids could not spend time with you anymore. And pretty soon the kids grew up and their life goes along without their dad living out there in the fields, living out there in the squalor and the yuckiness of the disease. <clears throat> Lepers, third thing about it, they were required to quarantine. And yes, they even had to wear masks. <laughs> Listen to this passage out of, out of Luke 13, I mean, out of Leviticus 13. It talks about how to take care of somebody once they're diagnosed, once a priest comes and confirms that they got the disease. Listen to what they have to do. Anyone with such a defined disease must wear torn clothing. You can't have good clothes anymore. You have to wear torn clothing. Their hair, their hair, like unlike everyone else in this room, their hair had to be unkept. You weren't allowed to brush it. You weren't allowed to comb it. You just had to let it go, not allowed to wash it. They had to cover the lower part of their face, lower part of their face. We're familiar with that now. And you had to yell out, unclean, unclean, unclean. Anytime someone approached you, you had to move aside. And you had to let them pass, unclean, unclean. You had to yell that so that they wouldn't come in your presence. This is out of Leviticus. And as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They were not allowed to come into the church. They were not, a, not allowed to come to the temple. They were not allowed to worship. They were not allowed to bring a sacrifice. They weren't allowed to do any of that stuff. They are ceremonially unclean for life. They must live alone. They can't live in an upstairs apartment. They can't live downstairs they have to live outside of the camp. If you had leprosy in the time of Jesus, it was a death sentence. It was a slow death sentence of loneliness, despair, discouragement, depression, and disease. You got it. There is no way around it. What a horrible, horrible thing to happen. And on Luke 17, verses 11 through 19, Jesus does something amazing. See, Jesus, the passage says, and I want to remind you where we're going, the passage says, now on his way to Jerusalem. Now, Luke, starting in chapter 9, verse 51, Luke says, Jesus resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem. And that's a marker. That's like a, a hands on Gretel little crumb. By the way, Luke says, we're going to Jesus. We're going to Jerusalem. And Jesus is not going to Jerusalem to worship. He's not going to Jerusalem to go in and celebrate the Passover like they would traditionally. He's not going to go in and, and take a sacrifice for our sins. He's going to go in and he's going to be sacrificed for our sins. He's going to go to Jerusalem, all right, but he's not going to be worshipped. He's going to be killed. He's also going to go outside of the camp. He's also going to be cursed at. He's also going to be yelled at. He is also going to die outside of the camp. But he, the perfect one, is going to die so that you could have a relationship with him, so that you can be made whole, so that you can be made well. He's on his way to Jerusalem, 951, 1322, 1331, 1711. Jesus, Luke is telling us, is on his way to Jerusalem. And on his way, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria in Galilee, there was another way, another very common way that the Jews would take because they didn't like the Samaritans. They would go, but they would not go close to Samaria because they hated the Samaritans. And they thought it was unsafe. They didn't like that route. And so because you yeah, might have to encounter a Samaritan, they didn't want to do that. And because, you know, you might get robbed or something like that, they didn't want to go there. Normally, they could take a path over the Jordan River, around through Pira, and then they would get to Jerusalem. This was not the common path. But this was the path that Jesus took because Jesus had some things to do. He had a mission to accomplish. There was a person or people he had to reach. 
So he traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. Ten men, a small cluster, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all ten of you gathering up on, on kind of probably a little bluff next to the path, not in the way of the path, next to the path. How did they hear about him? How did they know? Maybe, maybe they heard about Jesus through the Samaritan woman. You know, in John chapter 4, Jesus is in Samaria, and he goes, and he's tired, and he sits next to a well. And in the well, a woman comes up in the late afternoon, and she wants to draw some water, and Jesus ends up having a conversation with her, and Jesus invites her to go tell her, get her husband, and she says, I'm not married. He goes, yeah, I know. And he knows her story. And after, after he proclaims, I am, I am the living water, she goes and she goes tells everybody in Samaria, maybe this Samaritan woman told them that there's a guy who possibly is the Messiah. Maybe they heard about it from her. Maybe because they're close to Galilee, they heard about the miracles that Jesus had done in, around Galilee. He turned water into wine in Galilee. He called out an unclean spirit in Galilee. Oh, there, Peter had the miraculous catch of fish. You know, that was in the Sea of Galilee. The paralytic, the man, he was paralyzed and, he, and Jesus healed him. That happened in Galilee. Oh, the raising of Jairus' daughter, she was dead and now she's alive. That happened in Galilee. The healing of the woman who, who, had, who was bleeding and continued bleeding for years and years and no one could help her, that happened in Galilee. But you know what happened in Galilee, really happened in Galilee? Maybe they heard. See, there was a man with leprosy. Maybe originally there weren't 10. Maybe there were 11. And a man who had leprosy, he got up the courage one day, and he he came up, and Luke chapter 5, he encounters Jesus, but he doesn't do it from the bluff. He comes up, and Jesus does something incredible. Jesus touches him. Oh, Jesus heals the man who had leprosy. And now, instead of 11 lepers, there are 10. Maybe, just maybe, they knew who Jesus was because the man who used to be part of their group is healed and whole and made well. We don't know. We don't know how, G, how these lepers and the cluster of 10 heard about Jesus, but they did hear about him. They knew about him. Much like many of you people in our culture, much like many of you, you might know who Jesus is. You might actually have an idea. Who is Jesus? Oh, yeah, he's the guy they talk about. I think you read about him in the Bible. Every now and then I open my Bible. Well, it collects, as, as Jelly Roll says, maybe your Bible collects is a good place to hold dust. And so you got this dusty old Bible. You've heard of Jesus. You know, Christmas comes. Yay, Jesus. Oh, what a nice little baby. Easter comes. You ignore him. Whatever it is, you've heard of him. But there's a moment in your life that you need Jesus. These lepers were at that moment in their life that they needed Jesus. And they stood at a distance, not right in front of him. They stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice. A loud voice. There's a different word between now and what I'm going to use later. They stood out in a loud voice. Jesus. Master, have pity on us. Jesus, Master. And so they acknowledge that Jesus is the commander. Jesus, you're the commander. You're the boss. You're you're, you're the head honcho. You can do this. And they say, have pity on us. The Amplified Bible says, have pity and mercy on us. ESV says, Master, have mercy on us. Two important words that we need to look at. He's the master. We need to look at mercy. And compassion. Mercy. Jesus, have mercy. See, mercy, one definition is is showing kindness to someone whom it is within your power to punish or harm. Master, have mercy on us because you have the power to harm us. You have the power to punish us. And we're asking you to relieve the punishment that you have inflicted on us. And that's why you got the other word, compassion, pity, slash compassion. There's a deep awareness of the suffering of another person. You've got an awareness of it, but you also have the ability to do something about it. Mercy. You can harm, you can punish, but you choose to relieve it. Compassion. You're aware of it, and you have the ability to do something about it. See, a lot of us feel emotionally moved but we don't have the compassion. We don't do anything about it, so we're just emotionally moved with it. 
Compassion is where you not only hear of the need, but then you do something about it. See, here's the truth. They're lepers. Remember? They're homeless. They're helpless. They're hurting. They have nothing to give to Jesus. It's not like they can come into Jesus with their, with their gold-covered chariot, with all their wealth and all their sheep and all their wheat. They can't come to Jesus with anything. All they've got are ripped clothes, matty hair, probably flies inside their wounds, and all they have is themselves to say, Master, have compassion, mercy on us. Master, we need your help. We have nothing. And that's where it starts. That's the first thing we need to know is when we come to Jesus, we have nothing to give him. We just need to simply call out to him. Say, Jesus, help me. I know you have the power to punish, and I'm asking you not to punish me. I know you have the power to help, and I'm asking you to help. Lord, I need a favor. I need a favor. They ask nothing. They have nothing to give. And when he saw them, I want you to imagine you're a leper. Imagine you're one of the ten calling out. And when he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priest. He didn't say you're healed. He didn't say you're healed. He didn't say you're healed. He didn't say, come here, come here, let me touch you. Just like he did the one in Luke 5, he didn't say that at all. He said, you go, go and show themselves to the priests. Did they have a great disappointment? Were they greatly disappointed when that happened? Yet, one of them might say, yet another religious leader tells us to go and see the priest. Don't you know, Jesus, we've already seen the priests. That's why we're here. We've been diagnosed as being dirty, as being filled with sin, as being outcast and abandoned. We've already seen the priest. Don't you know, Jesus? They were probably expecting an instantaneous healing. Don't walk over that verse too fast. You're a leper. You're sick. You call it to Jesus. Have mercy. You have the power to punish and you have the power to harm, and I'm asking you not to harm. Have compassion on me, Jesus. You have the power. I'm hurting. Will you help? And he says, go. Look at the priest. And he continues walking down his merry way. (laughs) And you've got to go. I'm going to give you a clue I think the original language has a hint, is that they left. We don't know when they were healed, but they had to go over the horizon. They had to get out of eyesight of Jesus. See, here's the truth. Here's part of the key lesson here. Sometimes, many times, Jesus does not work like we want or expect him to work. Sometimes, Jesus doesn't work like you want or you expect him to work. If he did, every single one of us would have won the lottery already, right? If he did, that relationship would have not broken up. If he did, that accident would have happened. If he did, that cancer wouldn't have come. If he did, whatever it was wouldn't have happened. If he worked exactly like you thought you wanted him to work. Church, Jesus doesn't work like we want or expect him to work. And if you can get that point down, you're doing great. You won't be disappointed in Jesus because you're going to go, oh, maybe I have to be on the horizon for him to work. Maybe something else has to happen. Maybe God has a bigger plan. Maybe I need to have faith and trust that God knows what he's doing and I'm not God. And I need to walk through this valley of hurting, this valley of disappointment, this valley of challenge. Maybe, just maybe you haven't put your faith in Jesus. All you want him to do is be like the genie in the bottle. Please help me, help me, help me, help me. And he doesn't help you, so you're disappointed in Jesus so often. Don't be disappointed in Jesus because he has a plan. He has a plan. Watch this. See, it took faith for them to obey. It took faith for them to obey. They didn't even have enough faith. They needed to have enough faith when Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest, that as a group they said, Might as well go show ourselves to the priest. That's what he said to do. 
And so, as a group, they start walking towards the priest. They start walking to the priest, and, and you know, they're probably looking at each other, disappointed. Another religious leader, another disappointing guy says, you know, it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And look what the text says. And as they went, they were healed. This is my imagination. This is my imagination now. Imagine they're just kind of walking. They're on the other side of the bluff now. Jesus can't see them. They can't see Jesus. The guys walking. Remember, they have no sensation in some of their feet. None maybe in their fingers. And I go, ah, man, I, I stepped on a rock. Oh, that hurt. What? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I can feel in my feet. What? And he, and he pulls back, and all of a sudden, the bandit and the, the scars on the hands. Can you imagine that? It's, it's, they couldn't feel, and all of a sudden, they just start, wait a minute, I can feel. Woo-hoo! And they start getting excited. They start jumping up and down because for the first time in years, they can feel. They take their sandals off, and they feel the dirt. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, there's some green grass. I'm going to go in the green grass. Oh, splashing in some water. That feels great. Can you imagine that, church? Wouldn't that be fantastic? You haven't felt anything on your feet for years. Oh, you've got these dirty, rotten bandages and, and cuts that don't heal. And now, all of a sudden, you look at your hands that are whole and the skin. Oh, you're just jumping up and down for joy. All of you are like that, right? All of you are like that. God heals. You hear his word. Jesus spoke. You hear his word, and his word comes true. It might not be like you expected it, when you expected it, or how you expected it, but it happened. As they went, they were cleansed. If they would have stood right there, they might never have been cleansed, but they had enough faith to start walking towards the priest. Then, faith, faith, this is important. Because we want more than a favor. Faith turns to worship. I think a lot of people encounter Jesus. I think a lot of people ask Jesus for a favor, ask Jesus to work, and it stops right there. It doesn't go beyond that moment. God, help me. I'm hurting. I've got this disease. I've got this wound or whatever else. And God heals you, but it never turns into worship. It just turns into that moment where God heals you and you're good. Thank you, God. You don't even say thank you. You just continue on. One of them. This is why I jumped up and down. This is why I did it. When he saw that he was healed, he looked, he examined, he saw. This is the idea of the word is he, he stared at in amazement. Absolutely amazed. That's what the idea of that word is about. He's healed. This is important that you see this, that he was healed. The idea of that word is it's a physical healing. It's a physical healing. And then he said, then, he said in a loud voice. He saw, he was amazed, and then he came back praising God in a loud voice. Remember Remember they shouted from the hilltop, Jesus, Master, have pity on us? Hear this one guy. You can hear him. He's over the bluff. You can hear him coming like a train. Ah! All the way to Jesus. He is screaming at the top of his voice. You know why? Because the word loud is the same word we get the word mega from. Megaphone. It's, it's the idea. And then the voice would be phony, so it's megaphone. He is like a loud megaphone coming, running. Woo-hoo-hoo. Where is Jesus? In my rehearsal, I chose not to yell, right? <laughs> but, but you can just, you know, at first they were talking in a loud voice. That was not the same emphasis in the original language as this. This is this guy screaming at the top of his lungs, Jesus! Because it moved from simple, Lord, heal us. I need a favor. You granted my favor. And moving on. Dude, Lord, heal me. He heals you. And you got to move to worship. you got to move into worship. And he came back to Jesus. And you can only worship when you return back to Jesus. When you return back to Jesus, that's when worship starts. Amen? All right. And he threw himself 
And look at this. He threw himself at Jesus' feet. This guy, he's not shy. Maybe he is, but he's so excited about what happened, he threw himself at Jesus' feet. And he just is there. Can you imagine the crowd parting ways because they see this leper running to him? Guy, well, he used to be a leper. Now he's a whole guy running to Jesus, parting the crowd, boom, planting down at his feet. That's exactly the picture you got here. And then he realized that God's word is true. God's word. Jesus spoke. Jesus was the word. And the word said, go to the priest. Implied in that, if you go to the priest, you'll be healed. When he realized God's word is true, he cries out loud to the one who heals him. How are you doing it? Proclaiming thanks to God. How are you doing it? Worshiping God. How are you doing it? At giving praise to God for all of the miracles that He's done in your life. Fall. Worship happens when He falls at the feet of Jesus. That's when worship takes place. Worship takes place when you, in your mind, you get down in your mind and you fall at the feet of Jesus. You say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You healed me. You restored me. That's when our faith turns into worship. Many of us have faith to believe that Jesus can heal. But do we have faith to worship the one who heals us? That's a big difference. Did you catch it? Many of us, I've had people ask me all the time to pray for me. Pray for me, Pastor Paul. They just want the genie God. They don't want to come back and they don't want to worship him. They just want a God that they're good with, they're comfortable with, works exactly like they want him to work. I want a God I can worship that works above and beyond anything I could ask or think or imagine. That's the kind of God I have. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And he was a Samaritan. He wasn't part of the Jewish clan. He was a Samaritan. He was an outcast. He was a foreigner. The foreigner came, and the foreigner thanked and worshipped Jesus. And the passage says, we're not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to give praise to God except for the foreigner? This is the reason why I think that they're on the other side of the hill, on the other side of the bluff where they can no longer see. Because in here, the word was no one found. It means searching with scrutiny, observation. Implied, Jesus looks around. He can't see them anymore. They're no longer within his eyesight. Implied in the Greek definition of the word found is that Jesus looks up at that guy and he says, when no one else found? I think they went over that way. Remember they went that way? How come I don't see anybody else coming? I don't. So was no one else found to give praise to God except this foreigner? Oh, there's a great picture. We'll come back to this next week. There's a great picture in here. Then he said to him, rise and go. Here's the twist. Here's the twist to the story. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Not healed, but well. The, the implied meaning there is to save, to deliver, or rescue. Your faith, here's the picture of faith. They had a need. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Have mercy on us. They had a need. Jesus tells them, the word speaks. The word tells them what to do. In obedience, they do it, and they're healed. That's where many people's faith stops. God heals them. But here's a bigger lesson. One of them, one of them gives thanks. One of them comes back to Jesus. One of them worships with all of his might. And as a result, he is saved. He is delivered. He is rescued in the totality of who he is. Anybody can experience a miracle, church, and a miracle doesn't promise wholeness or being well. It is when God connects deep within you, he has made you well. 
He has forgiven all of your sins. He has healed you physically, emotionally, spiritually. You are well. And if you have placed your trust in Jesus, and if you have fallen down and worshipped him, you are well. Because some of you need to digest that. Some of you are trying to earn your way into who he is, but none. Right there, then, you are well. Are you struggling today? You are well. Are you discouraged? Are you depressed? You are well. If you've bowed your feet and proclaimed him as Lord, you are well. Notice that all of the problems that the leper had, he still has so many problems. He's still homeless. He still doesn't have any money. He's still bankrupt, and he's still homeless. He still got ratty old clothes on his body. He's still dirty in the hair. He has still got all of these issues. And yet Jesus can look at him and say he's well. Isn't that great, church? You don't have to put on a shirt and tie. You don't have to dress all fancy. You don't have to pretend that you and your family got along well before you came into the church and, and there was no arguing. You come here as you are, and Jesus, and you worship him. You are well. You are well. He still has major issues. He's externally still stinky, unkept, but he was well. He's still wearing rags, but he is well. He's still unemployed, but he is well. Ten were healed. Ten were healed. But only one was made well. That's incredible. Sometimes, church, being part of the majority isn't the best thing. Sometimes you need to be made well. And Jesus made him well. A well person has a continual sense of gratitude. A well person has a continual sense of gratitude. Earlier this week in my devotions, I think it was Monday, I was just, just thinking about people who were gra- grateful, even though they were in difficult situations, even though they had some challenging moments in front of their life. Here's one, Hannah. Remember his story? This is going to be Samuel's mom, and, and, and every year she goes to worship God, and, and she's not getting pregnant. Meanwhile, this other woman is her, um, her husband's other wife, and, and she prays, and she prays, and she prays, and she promises God that if she has a child, she'll bring him back. She will dedicate him to God. You know what happened? She struggles and struggles, but when God answers that prayer, she is made well. She is well. Because she fulfilled what she said. David, David was confronted by his sin from, the, from Nathan the prophet. Very dangerous job for David to do. And what does David do after he's confronted with his sin? He goes up and he confesses his sin to God. And through confession, he is made well. Daniel, he had circumstances. The culture didn't like him praying. The Lord, the the leaders, they didn't like him praying. He had political enemies. His political enemies didn't like him praying. The only thing they could hold against him, this guy prays a lot. Well, let's make a law to make it illegal to pray. They did. You know what Daniel did anyways? He prayed. And when he's in the lion's den, because they had to throw him in the lion's den, you know what he's doing? He's giving thanks. He's praising God. Situational circumstances should never dictate our thankfulness. Hezekiah, he was sick. He was sick. In fact, one of the prophets said, you know what, Hezekiah, got to get your life in order. You're going to go. And he prays to God. He is sick. And God heals him. And he rejoices. Paul and Silas, they're in prison. You know what they're in prison for? They robbed the corner liquor store. I'm just seeing if y'all are awake or not. Okay. Um, they're in prison because they were proclaiming who Jesus was. That's it. And they had enemies who didn't want them to proclaim Jesus. And so they get put in jail. And what, do they, what happens in jail? Are they bemoaning? Are they complaining that they didn't get enough sleep? Are they complaining that their job is horrible? Are they complaining about their situation and the circumstances in life? No. What are they doing? They're praising God. And what moves, what happens because of their praise? Oh, the j- and the jail opens up, and they are released miraculously. It's, it's, it's great, church. Church, are you knowing more for your complaining or more for your praising? How, what happens when bad things come your way, when challenging moments come? Prodigal son. Prodigal son, what does he do? He praises. He goes, he goes I'd rather be in my father's house. And, and he gives praise. Dad wraps everything around him, 
prodigal son, continual. The Apostle Paul says, in thanks, in everything, give thanks. A leper, he had nothing to offer God, absolutely zip. You guys have so much more to offer God than he did. And he comes back like a megaphone. Jesus runs, falls at his feet, praising God, praising God. He had nothing to offer God. The Apostle Paul says, give thanks in all situations. There's a story, the story of a balloonist. About 100 years ago, he wanted to take a balloon, and he wanted to ride his balloon out over the top of the Alps. And so he had his itinerary. He had a plan to go from city A to city B, from city B to city C, from city C to city D. And he inflates his balloon, and he heads off. But you know what? The winds take him. Instead of going the way he planned it from city A to city B, he goes from city A to city C. Huh. Well, that didn't work right. And then the next day he goes up, and he, and he blows up his balloon, and he goes from city C to city F. Well, that didn't work right. And then the next time he goes from city F to city K, well, that didn't work right. He didn't go anywhere that he thought he would go. And at the end of it, he said, you know what? I chose every morning just the delight in the new city that I was going to be in. I chose every day the delight in the new city that I'd be in. Instead of saying, this is my itinerary, and I have these plans, and I have this purpose, and, and if it goes this way, I'll rejoice, and if it doesn't, I'll panic. Every day, woke up and said, okay, show me where the winds blow. Can we do that every day? To God, I give you praise today. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what that doctor's test is going to be like. I don't know if I'm going to pass this exam or not, but I give you praise. I don't know if the food I'm going to have for lunch is any good, but I give you praise. Three things, and we'll close up. Three things. First, we need to be like the 10 person. And we need to return to Jesus. If there are any of you here who have simply asked Jesus for help and received the help, but you've never returned to Jesus, return to Jesus now. Return to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus, I come before you, and I just want to give you praise and worship because you are the one who answered this prayer. Just worship him. He knows your story. He knows everything about you. Two, worship him. Worship expresses your faith. And worship is more than singing the songs that Edgar does. You worship God with your heart throughout the day. You worship God in those quiet moments. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to trust you again. Thank you for this test, this trial, this turmoil that you're running me through. Thank you for the treasures that you have provided. And so as a result, you've given so much, I give it back to you. And so giving is an act of worship. You know that? When you put your tithe or your offering back there in that silver box, that's an act of worship going, God, everything I have is yours, and here's a portion of that. Worship, I give back to you, God. I give you. Oh, it's all yours. I'm just worshiping you. And then you need to know that he has made you well. Stop listening to anybody else that says you have to earn your way to God. You have to work your way towards salvation. You have, to, you have to tow this specific line in order to be saved. You are well. That leper, he had nothing. It's zero. And God made him well. God can make you well too. So with those three ideas of returning to Jesus, Worshiping him and knowing that he has made you well. You know, let's just not ask God for a favor. Let's worship him. Let's not be like Jolly Joe. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. We worship you, Lord, as a church. We just exalt you. You are worthy of all of our energies and our time. You are so good, so glorious, so great, so grand. Jesus Christ, thank you. So, Lord, I ask that you would bless the hearers of this message, whether they're online or whether they're in person, Lord, that you would bless them. And you, Lord, would, would show them how to worship you in truth and righteousness. Jesus, be with us as we now listen to your voice. 
closing song that Ed here is going to sing, and we worship you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Hey, thank you very much for watching. There are just a couple of steps that we want you to take. And if you have your phone with you, just scan the QR code, or if you're watching on your phone, simply tap on the link. The link will take you to a couple of things. One, a place to donate. It's always important that we're faithful in giving back to God. If he has blessed us, we're blessed to be a blessing, so we would ask you to give generously to the church. Two, to connect with us. Let us know who you are. Let us know who you are, and three, how to pray for you. We love to pray for you, and so we, uh, I can testify I've seen God work miracles, and so we'd love to see and join in prayer for you. Also, we'd love for you to come and visit, so just make way and come on a Sunday morning and visit. That way you get to see the live version of it instead of the live stream version of it. And if you have any questions, feel free to text those as well. But make sure you, that you subscribe. That becomes important to us, and make sure that you also like this video. The more people that like the video, the more people it will reach. So thank you very much for watching and have a blessed day.